Hello, everybody, and welcome to RICE Learning Machines Seminars. Uh, my name is Olaf Mogen, and uh, RICE is Sweden's public research institute with more than 3,000 people working on a wide array of, array of topics. The computer science department uh, works on AI, applied AI projects for the benefit of society, and uh, we organize these weekly learning machines seminars. This meeting will be recorded, and if anybody wants to be removed from this recording, just let us know. Uh, also, make sure to check out our list of great talks on our YouTube channel. Uh, today, I have the honor to introduce uh, Alisa Deblik, who is a senior researcher at Sony AI. Uh, she has a PhD in communication systems from KTH. Uh, she did her postdoc at IMT and Plat Atlantic at Rennes in France. Uh, and she's working on topics related to reinforcement learning. The topic today is uh, design of superhuman racing a AI agent, Gran Turismo Sophie, trained, to the deep, trained through deep reinforcement learning. And with this said, I will stop my sharing and hand over the word to you, Alisa. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the great introduction, Olaf. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you today uh, and to share our two year long journey of uh, training a superhuman a racing agent uh, that can beat the best uh, Gran Turismo drivers in the world with deep reinforcement learning. I'm also very happy to tell you that GT Sophic, how we call it, <laughs> is no longer just a, a research top prototype, uh, that it's actually now uh, became a permanent addition to the Gran Turismo game, the PlayStation 5 version of it, since November 2nd. So I encourage everyone to try it out and tell us what you think about it. I will talk, touch upon the production phase also a little bit at the end uh, of this presentation. Uh, so this is a, a team that has worked on super uh, human racing agent of GD Sophie. It consists of 25 people. This has been a team assembled of research scientists, um, platform and engineering team, uh, and also the, the management. Uh, currently, we are a much bigger team uh, and, and are working also on other challenges. But since the focus of the talk is uh, about our first challenge, uh, I'm presenting you uh, more of this subset of, of our team here. Uh, so our mission of Sony AI organization is to actually to create AI techniques that can empower uh, the human imagination of content creators, uh, artists, makers, creators around the world, uh, and also to make them work in harmony with humans uh, to benefit the society. So who are we? The Sony AI is a very young research organization that has been established in April 2020. Uh, it has a remote workforce in North America, and it also has the offices in Tokyo, Zurich, uh, and also recently Barcelona. Uh, we have been working on four flagship projects. Uh, one of them is gastronomy. Uh, the second is gaming, uh, imaging and sensing, and also AI ethics. If you would like to hear more about it, please check our website. So this project has been uh, uh, done in the partnership with uh, Opsoni AI, who, is, uh, who has been training this agent. The Polyphony Digital, which is a, uh, the manufacturer of uh, Gran Turismo game, and Sony Interactive Entertainment that was providing us with cloud gaming infrastructure and also is a vendor of PlayStation. So I'm sure you all heard about Gran Turismo. <laughs> so uh, the Gran Turismo is a very high fidelity racing game, simulation game, that very accurately captures a lot of physics involved in the racing, including the aerodynamics effects on the car at the speed, the effects of slipstream when uh, two cars are close to each other, tire traction and how it changes with speed and angle and conditions, the actual track conditions like rain, wind, snow, and a lot more. It's also a very robust esports platform with annual competitions that pick the best drivers against each other for probably a decade or so. Most recently, it was used in 2022 Virtual Olympics, which was the first time the Olympics held virtual events alongside the traditional physical events. Our grand challenge was to try and to train an AI that can compete the best, with the best GT drivers in the world. Uh, so how does this look like? This little team is from one of the GT championships in 2019. As you can see, the cars are moving very closely to each other, wheel to wheel at very high speeds. 
at the limits of traction of the cars, and they have skills to execute the complex passing maneuvers, not collide with each other, and not cause major problems to each other on the track. Uh, so the great challenge, as I said, was the, that we develop an AI that can compete with the best GT drivers in the world. And why is that? When you are one of the top 10 GT drivers in the world, you don't actually have so much chances to train and to improve uh, your racing skills. So having an AI agent that is always available, always online, that can actually teach you some new racing skills is actually something that they wished for uh, since a long time ago. And this is why we picked uh, exactly this as our first grand challenge to develop a superhuman AI agent that can beat, even beat these drivers. Um, let's go to the next slide. So for our grand challenge, uh, we race four uh, Sophie agents against the four world's top GT drivers on three track car combinations. The first track was a Dragon Trail Seaside, uh, which had uh, high performance road vehicles. On the second track, Lago Maggiore, uh, we had the vehicle that was equivalent to the Federation International Automobile GT3 class of race cars. And the third and final race took place on uh, Circa de la Sal, which is famous also as the home of the 24 Hours of La Marche. This race featured the Red Bull X 2019 competition race car, which can exceed the speeds of 300 kilometers per hour. Uh, so you might wonder why, if these are top GT drivers, why are all maybe Japanese? Well, imagine this was a world, this was a year 2021, which was in the middle of the pandemics. So it was actually very difficult to bring these top drivers in Japan. But nevertheless, these four drivers actually lie in the top 10 and uh, the, the races worked out very well. So we had in total two races. First was the July race and second was October race. Uh, so I will tell you a little bit more about scores. In the first one, uh, actually GT Sophie managed to, become, uh, to, to be the fastest one in terms of the fastest lap time. But in the competitions with other uh, uh, cars, uh, it won in one out of the three races. And in, then we did a rematch we came back, we took the dust off, we improved <laughs> our network architecture training regimes upon the population, and we basically came back in October rematch, and not only GT Sophie was the fastest of all cars, but it also won three out of three matches. Points were awarded for each final place with points that were doubled for SAR because it was the most complex uh, track. Um, Here's a short teaser to give you a feeling for what we worked on in the last two years. There's very few places where you can go out and say, I'm going to build an AI and I'm going to make it truly superhuman. to create artificial intelligence that will unleash the power of the human creativity and imagination. Gran Turismo of Sophie is a super exciting project. It's an amazing AI research and development activity. There are many racing games where the physics is half done, but in Gran Turismo, that racing sensation that the players get, that's really at the core of the game. この車文化、車という存在をもう丸ごとビデオゲームの中にこう再現したいなと思ったんですね。Because of the realism of the game, it is actually very difficult to program agents. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out what things we needed to change in order to get that superhuman performance. Why are we building this uh, GT Sophie agent? This is not just a technical breakthrough project. It really is about bringing AI into the hands of the game developers who are going to build the new experiences for the players.
And these results actually enable us to publish uh, these results in the Nature paper, but not only that, we actually ended up on the cover of the Nature paper because it was a technical breakthrough. So how did we solve this? So, oh, which one? I'm sorry. Um, so there were three major challenges uh, to be able to actually uh, train an agent that can race in this kind of environment. So first one was a race car control to actually uh, in, make an agent that can control the car at high speed at the race line to figure out the physics in such a way that it was able to be competitive with its very top performing drivers. Um, the second category we call the racing taxis. This is about understanding when and how to pass without colliding, taking advantage of things like slipstream to execute uh, slipstream passing, uh, and even some defensive maneuvers such as blocking. And the third group of challenges, uh, which was around the area of racing etiquette or sportsmanship. Uh, and in real world racing, you're actually doing this with a very expensive high-end cars uh, and uh, people lives are at stakes. Uh, so you're always kind of in between racing at the edge of the track and, and uh, one step away from a disaster, from a catastrophe. So it is very important that you respect the rules of fair play and make sure that no major incidents happen on the track. So we trained an agent using reinforcement learning, and I hope you're all familiar here with the concept. At a high level, we have an AI agent that uh, acts separately from the environment. Uh, it sees the state of the world through some kind of observation stream. Here you can get the speed, the position of the car, the velocity. And based on the state, you make, uh, make an action on the world. And then you see the effects of these actions. Through the reward signal that AI agent obtains, it learns to control the world through its actions in such a way to maximize its long-term reward. So in order to explain how this agent works, so we have to talk about states, action, and reward signals that we use to train it. We train the agents for the most part in cloud infrastructure because we needed a lot of computing resources to be able to do this at scale. So we leverage the Sony Interactive Entertainment's PlayStations in the cloud network, which is usually available for human to play uh, PlayStation games when they're not in front of the PlayStation. So when humans were not using these machines, we were allowed to use them to train our agents, which is a phenomenal resource to have access to. The game, uh, now if you look at the, our diagram, the game only runs on PlayStation. So we have to claim a PlayStation for every instance of the game we want to use to train an agent. The agent runs separately on a different computer in the form of these rollout workers. And then they collect experiences throughout observations of state, action, rewards, and send this back to a centralized trainer. That trainer is storing, storing all these pieces of information in experience replay buffer, which we trained with an algorithm called quantile regression SAC, a, a software for the critic, that updates the policies with all this new information, sends the latest policies back to the agent, and then they switch to this late and start using these latest policies uh, uh, in their experiences in the world. A typical agent that we trained was with 20 PlayStations, 20 rollout workers, and one trainer collecting data and updating the policies. So I mentioned briefly the QR SAC. This was actually one of the uh, most uh, largest innovations that we did that actually enabled us this uh, superhuman performance. It showed dramatic improvement in both time trial and versus runs. And, uh, how does it work? So PureSec actually extends uh, the soft, uh, soft actocritic algorithm in a way that instead of uh, estimating the uh, estimated the, the expected uh, future returns, like expecting mean uh, value of the future returns, it actually models the probability of future outcomes. Um, and it postulates that this modeling of possi uh, possible outcomes, like having the distribution, actually help the SOFI uh, to determine the razor's edge that was needed to drive between the track uh, and car limits and the disaster. Because uh, having the entire di probability distribution uh, uh, instead of like the mean value, it gives you actually the more information. This is our hypothesis. And we also, besides the uh, quantile regression Q function, we also used end step returns, uh, which uh, actually helped us to uh, improve stability and speed of learning in our domain with high frequency actions. In the right, uh, uh, on the right side of, uh, of, the plot of the slide, you can see actually the results uh, on the left times uh, on Majora track. 
uh, how our RLR rate of pure sec uh, was compared with vanilla sec and how it helped us achieve the better results. So you can see that actually pure sec achieved uh, half of a second uh, shorter lap time, which was like in this uh, racing domain, like a huge to determine the actual final places. And that end step returns uh, de uh, decrease this uh, lap time even further. So uh, we did in this bar in the in the blue, dark blue color, you can actually see the n equal to five and the lap time that corresponds to our uh, July race that we used in July race, but we change it to n equal to seven after doing this ablation study. N equal to nine produced only a tiny game and was not worth of adding uh, the complete extra uh, computation costs. A, uh, a question on that sure. slide, if it's okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, my view is that SAC is somewhat more unstable than, let's say, PPO. So does mm -hmm. this, uh, the quantile regression and the end step returns, did that actually help for in terms of stability or... Uh, why yes. did you go for SAC in the first? Uh... Well, we we thought the same. <laughs> and actually, I implemented yeah. the PPO and compared with the SAC. First of all, uh, PPO is less uh, uh, less sample efficient. Uh, it takes much longer time to converge. And in such a complex mm -hmm. domain, we didn't see that it can actually even achieve uh, uh, shorter lap times. Uh, we didn't prove like I tried to do with different, uh, I changed different hyperparameters, uh, different uh, and different kind of uh, uh, parameters of PPO and I, uh, and uh, clipping uh, tricks and everything at that time, but it didn't really show that it was better. Okay. And uh, and SAC itself wasn't enough to achieve the superhuman uh, performance. So as I said, um, you know, uh, actions, rewards, and uh, estimating returns, those are all, all random variables. Mm -hmm. And our hypothesis is, okay, when you have such a random and stochasticity, uh, and you try to average them, uh, it gives you kind of, it contains less information than if you build the entire probability distribution. And mm -hmm. quantile regression is actually putting them into these quantiles. We, we use like 32 quantiles. And having them as kind of uh, enable first uh, an agent to look n step ahead and look at the uh, like all possible future, like uh, probability distribution of all, all possible future outcomes instead of just the mean value, it definitely contains more information. It was able to make better action. So that improved policy even further. Okay. And you didn't really have any stability issues uh, with the SAC? at the wall or uh, it, it just worked out of the box? So it wasn't just this stack that uh, that was uh, that enabled us to come to this uh, results. I will show a little bit more what was still needed. But in terms right. of uh, algorithms, yes, it, that, that worked for us quite well. OK. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what did the car know about its own state? It could see the velocity in x, y directions, its acceleration in x, y, z directions, but also it knew its roll pitch and jaw angular velocities, and it knew the load on each of the four tires. It also got a signal to the direction of the tires with respect to the direction of the car, so that the car was actually uh, knew that at, uh, if it was slipping and at what angle it was slipping at, and it knew how far around the track it had gone. And very importantly, it also got the signals about the track ahead of it, like uh, six uh, seconds ahead of it, what's coming next. The agent acted at 10 Hertz, which is pretty slow uh, pace at which it takes actions in such a high speed environment. But for various technical reasons that works for us, and that was a very, very reliable rate at which we could communicate uh, with the game and be sure that our actions are taking effect on the world. The actions that the agent would take were simply braking or throttle, scale, scale to values of minus one for braking and one for pressing the throttle full. So those were the continuous action. And similar to like the steering actions, turning left was mapped to minus one or uh, turning right was again mapped to one. The major reward signal was progress uh, that was making along the center line of the course. So from time step to time step, we looked where it was projected to the center line and the reward it got uh, the next point in time was how far uh, it traveled from the previous point. There were a couple of other rewards in form of penalties that we uh, applied to encourage uh, the right kind of the behavior that we wanted. First one was a tire slip uh, penalty for sleeping, for tire slipping on a track, which is generally a bad idea. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, there is another penalty for, uh, of course, for agent going of course, uh, which was meaning if you have more than two tires off the edge of the course, uh, and this was consistent uh, with how the game evaluated whether you're of course or not. And another penalty for hitting the wall. And this was kind of enough to, uh, to train an agent to, uh, to uh, race fast, to be like the fastest. And how did we evaluate another... how fast? Mm -hmm. Sure, <laughs> so, uh, sorry to interrupt. So going back to the reward, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I've monitored a bit the the agents that they used to uh, race in the, the Amazon racer, whatever it's called, I've forgotten. But uh, it, usually the, uh, a lot of that is around uh, reward engineering and they're trying to yeah. construct this optimal racing line and penalize like the distance from the racing line and everything. So if I understood you correctly here, you're, you don't actually encode the racing line, but only penalize going off course, is that? Oh, well, we do, right? we do. So we have something like uh, course points. Um, yeah. I have one video, but it's not showing well that it, that's why I excluded it here. Uh, so we have encoded uh, kind of uh, what's coming next. So we have a center line oh, and we have two edges, right? So we have a left edge and the right edge. This is like, uh, to like encode the path uh, uh, of each of, of each track, and it, we were also like putting the points ahead, which were kind of evenly distributed ahead, so that uh, based on how fast the agent was driving, he would know like uh, how many points ahead it uh, it, it it looks. So um, we had to have kind of some uh, notion of like course. It, we called it course V, which is heuristically computed like uh, how to, to be able to kind of see from a point, point step to a point step, like how much progress we made. And then we projected this to the center line and kind of uh, computed how much the distance that it traveled from that previous point. Because, you know, all the tracks are not just straight, they're uh, under different attitudes and angles. So it was important that we have some kind of reference line. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Very good answer. Thank you. And so how did he evaluate how fast this agent is? Uh, fortunately, we had a lot of uh, data in which human had taken the same car on the same track uh, or Maggiore and tried to get the best possible time trial times that they could. So here is a, gr a graph uh, that blue distribution shows the results about 1,200 players, each having tried many times and then submitted their best lap, individual lap time. Horizontal axis is the best lap time that they recorded. Vertical is the number of players who fall into that specific bucket. On top of you see the orange lines, which are like basically overlaid over this blue distribution that show how long it took uh, our agent GT Sophie to reach that level of performance when it was training. So when we started training about four hours of training with about 20 playstations, the agent could go around the track reasonably well, but it wasn't very fast. After about eight hours, uh, it was about top 20% of the players. After about 24 hours, it moved to the top 5% of our players and then we trained for another 10 days. And over time, it got incrementally better and better until it eventually reached a superhuman trial event. And this little graph on the bottom, let's see if I can, okay. <laughs> uh, this little graph on the bottom left shows how we look at this very end of uh, the tail of the distribution. So each of those circles are the top five human times, one being the best human recorded any data on this particular time trial, and the little orange histogram underneath is our time trial policy. We let it uh, run for 100 laps and then record the distribution of lap times. In this particular example, Lake Maggiore, we see that there is only one human who is just slightly better than the mean lap time of the GT Sophie. So his individual best uh, lap time was better than the mean lap time of GT Sophie only on this track, not on, not on other track. And that is the best individual uh, uh, lap time uh, so uh, this particular person's name was Valerio Gallo, who was the winner of 2022 Virtual Olympics and was also the only person who had a chance to race against GT Sophie and see how it performed before this data was recorded. So now how did it look like when you press run on this experiment? The neural network policy at first just outputs random control signals, but already 15 minutes into training, it successfully learned to navigate the course. After every additional hour of training, it learns to get the maximum out of car and track, driving close to the edge and braking at exactly the right time. Now you would probably ask, okay, so where is the AI better? <laughs> okay, here we have um, 
one of the top GT drivers, Igor Praga. And we kind of computed the cumulative gap to SOFI time. So to see like where is, because if you see here, GT SOFI lap times do not actually overlap with stock humans at all. SOFI was so much faster. But if you look uh, on like a specific circle de la Sarte a curve, we see that basically uh, during the straightaways, there's not so much difference between the human time and the SOFI time. But where it's actually getting faster is through the chicanes. And those are actually discolored uh, 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 tights, like corners back and forth turns that interrupt the straightaways. So you can see the dips in the bottom left chart as Sophie pulls away. And when you sum up these dips, this is where basically when accumulated, the Sophie gets better. But being faster isn't enough. So we had to put the Sophie uh, in the traffic with other cars. Uh, and the first step in racing with other cars is how to represent them in the feature space. And we explored here a lot of representations, including attention models, <laughs> grid layouts, putting the track ahead of us, behind us. And at the end, this is the simplest approach that worked. So we went with a straight head, uh, one, uh, two lists, one representing cars ahead and then another uh, representing cars behind. And the cars were ordered in the list just by how close they were to GT Sophie. For each car in the list, GT Sophie gets the relative position, velocity, and accelerations uh, of other cars. And uh, when we say opponent, GT Sophie really didn't distinguish between who controlled that car. You know, it 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 was it could be another GT Sophie, or it could be a human, it could be a built-in AI. Uh, so it treated everyone on the course as the opponent. To encourage the, uh, the agent to pass other cars, we had to give it a reward to accomplish that, which basically was a symmetrical reward because we wanted to encourage the Sophie to overtake other cars, cars, but also to prevent itself from being overtaken. So it's a simple reward uh, between one point of the time to another, uh, where if you close the gap between you and the car in front, you get a reward. If that gap opens, you get a small penalty. Same thing is if the car is the opponent is behind you. If it gains on you, you get a small penalty. If you extend the lead, you get a small reward. And this is applied over only a small wind of cars nearby us. But that's not enough. Again, <laughs> in addition to training the agent to drive by himself, we had to put it in a lot of situations in which it faced traffic. And we had the, the problem, which is called exposure problem because it's not so easy to actually end up in the situations which were the most interesting for us where they wanted to learn the skills like a strip slipstream pass or a crossover pass. So we added a certain uh, training scenario, traffical and tactical uh, scenarios. Um, the basic scenarios for training an agent involve the first five configurations where we, uh, in the first one, we take 20 cars, sprinting them around the track. Each one is controlled by our agent. Uh, each one of these red dots is our agent. And we start them and uh, they start to learn to drive. Eventually they're so good at the driving that they never see each other on the track because they operate all of the same policy and they eventually go very fast, equally fast. The other four configurations are var our variations where we put our agent with opponents, where we vary the number of opponents from one to seven and we put uh, our agent behind it. Uh, but uh, in order to train in realistic uh, racing scenario, we could not rely on the agent and its opponents to randomly reach interesting configurations. Instead, we use specifically selected scenarios that help them to teach skills like running in a crowded start, launching behind an opponent, making a slipstream to overtake or crossover pass, um, and uh, navigating difficult chicanes. So these scenarios, as well as the opponents and other launch parameters were chosen randomly based on tuned weightings every time a rollout task needs to be launched. But the problem is <laughs> that if you are familiar with the different enforcement learning, you will know that the agent, if it doesn't experience uh, the, the similar situations uh, over the time, it starts forgetting. So in order to maintain uh, the learned skills, so not only to learn them, but to maintain them across epochs, we needed to stabilize the training distributions in two places. We had to uh, store these skills into the multiple tables in experient replay buffers, and also sample from the tables with fixed proportions when constructing a mini batch. Uh, so this was like a really crucial thing for us to, um, to basically come up with, also come up with this uh, superhuman uh, performance. 
So storing data like from these different training scenarios in separate tables, and then uh, for in each course uh, position, basically to have fixed proportions of these scenarios and put them into mini batch of training, this was uh, very important uh, to kind of have the policies converge. So it was not only having the SAC or QR SAC, this was also like multi tables were very, very important uh, uh, for or stratified sampling, how we call it, was very important to reach this performance. Now we've got the second part then of this straight. This is one of the best overtaking opportunities because, of course, you've got the advantage of the slip through, but you need to do it on the straight. You can't do it going into the braking zone because there isn't one. And you can see that Arans knows that, goes towards the outside line and is ahead then of Tomoaki Yamanaka as they come in towards Indianapolis. So it's the Sophie AI system ahead of Tomoaki Yamanaka. So it's Miyazono from AI, from Yamanaka from AI. So this is an example of a GT Sophie executing a slipstream pass. In all these videos, humans are actually driving white cars and GT Sophie is driving very colorful cars. So announcer and colorful graphics help a lot. Uh, now I will show you the example of the defense maneuver. Hold their line and hold firm against the AI, but it certainly proved to be a tougher challenge than I should imagine that they were thinking. Emerald goes defensive then. Miyazono tries to get the switch back on the inside. No opportunity presents itself through turn three then. So uh, we see now that this uh, skill has actually got learned. Um, and what I will show you now is that, um, so it, yeah, in, in this video, what you've seen is actually the green car to learn a defensive maneuver. And it moves to the inside to prevent from uh, being passed by the poor human behind him. In the next uh, slide, I'll show you a double crossover pass, which is a very interesting uh, 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 example that our agent actually learned the skill and even generalized over it. Because you will see the two instances of GT Sophie at the same time passing two opponents, but in a very different curves. You will also see on the red, with a red dotted line, a curve that the GT Sophie would take if it would be alone uh, with the opponent on the track. But it is actually very contextualized because the, uh, it learned the skill well. We go once again a defensive move there from Emerald, but losing two, losing three position there for Emerald. Oh, and contact there as well, as I think Miyazono got a bit of a hit from Greece. Greece goes up into P5. Here comes Emerald on the outside. And so this is exactly what so you have here the animation basically, where it shows you that two instances of GT Sophia passing two humans in the same corner. So this is also like a very successful example uh, of how uh, the agent has learned to do uh, the crossover pass. So I mentioned the first two challenges, which was the race car control and uh, uh, racing tactics. Uh, so the third challenge was actually uh, to being a good sport uh, and uh, learning the taxes that you need to win and being very competitive is actually very opposite of being a good sport. Uh, these things are pretty diametrically opposed to each other, and it was very difficult to balance them to make sure that you will have an agent that is going to be acceptable to race against. So let's talk about racing at etiquette a little bit more. So uh, racing has a very subtle, imprecise sportsmanship rules uh, that basically define in what conditions an agent, uh, a, 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 a player should actually get penalty. So this little block of text is taken from the Federal International Autosports Racing Guidelines. It says under what conditions judges view incidents on the course and may hand out penalties. And if you look at the text in the green, there are very subjective words. A driver may get the penalty if they cause an avoidable collision, if they forced another driver off the track, if they illegitimately prevented an overtaking maneuver, or illegitimately block another driver in overtaking maneuver. And these incidents are evaluated by human judges who are not like doing this at real time. They stop the race, then they look at the video replays and make judgments about whether any of the players involved deserve a penalty uh, based on uh, what exactly happened with that car. So it's not about whether you hit another car and how hard you hit it, but actually what happens to the cars after the event. So these judgments tend to be very contextual. So uh, it was very difficult to encode this. It is in our very, very system. interesting. And this is proving to be a very exciting climax to the race. And it's going to make things very interesting in terms of the overall point standings then here as well. We come through our Nars. That was the last real overtaking opportunity then for Sophia Rons. But is Yamanaka going to try and invent something down into the Porsche curves? You bet he is. What a move then from Tomoaki Yamanaka to get it ahead. Orange runs it a bit wide through that. 
So this is an example where our agent was just a little bit too timid uh, because he was trying to be too good at sports. And it looks like that Yamanaka actually did a very good uh, slipstream pass on GD Sophie. But if you look very closely, you'll see that GD Sophie actually moved out of the way. And it didn't need to move that. It had the right to be assertive and hold its line. Whereas here is the, uh, the example of the too aggressive behavior. Oh, but Cochran, these guys need to be working together really at this stage because look at our arms really close onto the back. Was there a bit of contact into the left hander? I think there was. Cochran pushed onto the gravel and losing a position. So, on the other hand, this is what it looks like to be a too aggressive. Uh, and even in this uh, video, you don't really see Sophie being so uh, aggressive because it was a very small bump of Sophie Ranch uh, to the back of the car in front of it. But because of where it happened and that uh, the opponent went off course and lost several positions in the race, therefore our card got a penalty. So let's talk about the sportsmanship reward components. Uh, so how did we encourage our agent to be the good of the sports? We included rewards in terms of penalties that discourage this kind of collisions. Unfortunately, there is no ground truth to this problem. <laughs> there is no system built in a game that will tell us if our agent did something that deserved a penalty. And when, even when it gets to the highest level, like to the judges, these decisions uh, are made very subjectively. We don't have access to them. We can't collect enough data to actually train the system based on the input. So what we did is uh, we reward engineering it. <laughs> uh, so we gave penalties for any collisions the agent was at fault, any collision the agent was involved with, we gave another penalty if that collision involved uh, our agent hitting the car in front from the rear. We found also uh, three, uh, on Circa de la Sarda that we had to add three few uh, extra penalties to get the agent to be well behaved because of the speed and the complexity of that track and the car. So instead, uh, in that case, there were yet another penalty if you bump the car on a straightaway from a side. So if you sideswiped it, if you also rear end it on the straight, uh, and also in the corner. Uh, if you uh, had a slide swipe during the corner when you were not rear-ended. And I know this is kind of unsatisfying because there is no really clear set of rules that tell us how to construct a reward signal to train an agent to be good sport, but this actually worked for us, what we were trying to do. Uh, however, teaching an agent with these underspecified human norms is still an open research question. We also found out that this opponent uh, selection, the po population of opponents that we used to train our agent was very important uh, and impacted a lot our sportsmanship. We did some tests later on to understand this relationship. So the, uh, looking at the plot here uh, to the right, uh, the vertical axis here is kind of the uh, proxy for incidents in which our agent might have gotten a penalty for hitting another car. So we call it a number of questionable collisions. And the horizontal axis is the score of the four of these agents that raced against four uh, of the <clears throat> best, our best agents. So the maximum uh, number of points was 19.5, so close to 20. This would be winning the race. Uh, and our baseline, uh, which kind of are randomly selected policies from multiple trainings run multiple times, uh, was basically showing uh, the, the best behavior where we want it uh, to be kind of the, to have the lowest number of collisions possible and the highest uh, competitiveness score. So being to the right and lower is the, idea, the ideal space in this graph. Uh, we found it raised in practice too much against built-in AI, uh, which was a little slow and courteous. We became too aggressive overall because the agent was expecting opponent to get out of the way when they didn't have to. And if we trained against an aggressive agent that we had selected, we became too cautious because we were afraid uh, to, of getting hit. So there was no really clear, uh, perfect scheme, but it seems that the, clearly that the behavior of the opponents and learning the right skills, you really have to have a representative other, uh, other agents to play against. Uh, so I will talk about a little bit about how we selected the policy. So the graph on the right uh, shows various versions of Sophie temporarily losing ability to slipstream pass. So uh, the problem is again, uh, as I said, it it kind of varied. It had fluctuations uh, in the training data where it was um, losing the ability to slipstream pass. So we had to kind of have a mechanism how to select the policy. So the best run is the baseline, uh, which was with all the bells and whistles, but even that one sometimes lost the skill. Therefore, we needed a fairly complicated assessment procedure to judge policies. 
So on the bottom, policies from various runs go through filtering based on the basic evaluation test. Uh, so we have further filtering, and that could be like, okay, uh, filter out all the candidate policy that had a uh, lap time greater than a certain, like 114 uh, seconds. Uh, um, then uh, after that, there is an anathlon of skill test included, uh, four times four racing uh, and targeted tests of specific scenarios further window of the field. The final few policies then race against each other in four versus four policy versus policy matches, uh, ranked and then tested against humans for etiquette and any remaining flaws uh, leaving us with a final GT software policy. So how did it end up? As I said, there were two, um, two races, one in July and another in October. In the first one, we did pretty well, but not as well as we hoped. Uh, these are the results on the left side from the first race. Uh, our agent was faster on all three tracks that got us to start in the first, third, fifth, and seventh position. Uh, but when we raced against other humans, uh, GT Sophie won, won in only one out of the three races. Uh, but then uh, we were not really happy. Uh, we were sad. Oh, we came back home. We uh, dusted uh, the, uh, like the dust off. We kind of uh, got back to the drawing table, discussed uh, what went wrong, analyzed, improved certain things, and then went back for October rematch, where GT Sophie was not only the fastest one, but also in all out of three races, it won against the human. And we ended up having the double number of points uh, than the humans. And this was a very uh, rewarding outcome, which was not uh, that significantly significant. We get to do this only once. There is only 20 to 30 people in the world that you can race against at this level. So it is very hard to collect a lot of data, but it shows that we reached an upper echelon of the ability to race. So I mentioned that there were some things that didn't go well in July. So the agent lost control uh, the, it, at some places. It lost positions in starts. It gave away the position unnecessary, which we just saw in the video. It didn't use the speed to close the gap. Uh, we saw it also in the timid video behavior. But after July match, we improved uh, the training regime. We increased the network size. We made small modifications to some feature and rewards and improved the population of opponents. And this is the uh, result. And this was the final race of October of the competition. And if you look closely here, this is exactly the same location where our timid agent gave back a position to Yamanaka. But in this case, GD Sophie passes Yamanaka and never hits the brakes, showing that our new training scenarios and opponent population helped train GD Sophie to be aggressive enough to win, while the reward function produced etiquette and clean pass for the eventual win. And now I'll go to, uh, to see, see some, uh, hear some driver testimonials. I... It was really interesting seeing the lines where the AI would go. So there were certain corners that I was going out wide and then cutting back in, and the AI was going like in the whole way around. So I learned a lot about the lines and also um, knowing what to prioritize. Like the AI into turn one, for example, I was breaking later than the AI but the AI would get a much better exit than me and beat me to the next corner. Um, so I, I, I didn't notice that until I saw the AI and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I should do that <laughs> instead. Yeah, this was uh, the quote of Emily uh, that actually, uh, after running a time trial race against the ghost version of Sophie and Majorian time trial set. Um, and now I'll uh, spend a little bit of minutes just to tell you about uh, our next challenge, which was as challenging as the uh, getting uh, the GT Sophie to, to get a superhuman uh, behavior and be the best drivers in the world. Now, once you have a very fast GT Sophie, how do you slow it down? Uh, how do you now make it available to all possible users of different ranks, uh, different skills, uh, run it on different tracks and so on, and put it in the production? So. I'll tell you just a little bit. 
um, so we had a time limited re uh, release uh, of uh, our GT Sophie in the game during the February to March. Um, and uh, our goal was to make GT Sophie a fundraise opponent in the game. So we had uh, four car races at four tracks. GT Sophie was driving four different car models in positions one, two, three, and five. Uh, where on the five, we put the fastest Sophie car. The human was starting in position four with a faster car determined by the level, whether it was beginner, intermediate, expert. Uh, so the difficulty uh, of the GT Sophie of the agent was scaled with the car, uh, with the mod model of the car. So the people, the performance point and tuning of the player cars. So if you wanted to run an expert version, then you would put uh, the, your car uh, in the same one as the GT Sophie. And uh, these are kind of the, uh, the reactions of people were that uh, this is seriously fun uh, in, uh, in real world to practice your racing. However, GT Sophie was still too fast. <laughs> uh, I will skip this. So uh, we collected the feedback from the community to help build us the next version. So we were, uh, at the beginning, we, uh, in this version, we had fixed number of cars and races, so four cars and four races. Car models and tires were fixed. And as I said, the superhuman GT Sophie is still too fast. So we wanted to give players more controls over the races to choose any car in the garage along with any tire, uh, to be accessible to a wide range of players and skill levels, uh, to be fun, interactive player, and to be permanently added to the game. <laughs> Uh, on the 2nd of November. So the GT Sophie can now drive 340 cars with nine dry tire compounds. It's available on nine tracks. Players can choose their opponent between regular AI and GT Sophie and can use almost any car in the game to race against GT Sophie. These are kind of uh, the, uh, the feedbacks that we got. People are very impressed because we made um, GT Sophie more human-like behavior. Uh, we downscaled the behavior, we managed to now uh, set a difficulty level uh, and run it on different cars. So hopefully we will, uh, in future game updates, expand the availability of tracks by track. Upcoming challenges are to add tire wear, pit strategy, penalties, uh, weather conditions, and other racing challenges. Also to introduce more strategic decision-making and opponent modeling, uh, to also add explainability and interpretability of GT Sophie behavior, which is very difficult because of the continuous sections of steering uh, and throttle and braking, and to identify the degree to which our insights can apply to also other domains, and also uh, try to uh, like learn the GT Sophie to drive with different styles. So as I said, we published a nature paper and got the cover here. Uh, we got uh, the ACM SIG AI Industry Award for the Excellence in Artificial Intelligence for this recent AI breakthrough, GT Sophie. Uh, again, this is our team. And last but not least, I'm putting you another video for the end. The more we learned about what it took to be a good race car driver, the more challenging and interesting the project became. Smart people want to work on interesting and amazing projects. Could we build an AI that is able to beat the best Gran Turismo drivers in the world? If you're going to go and try to race the best in the world at Gran Turismo, you're going to need some serious compute. There is such a thin line between making it and not making it. It's very stressful to watch the agent in an actual competition because it's moments away from a massive accident. We were all like screaming and full of adrenaline. <laughs> it was incredible. Our journey has not ended yet. And thank you so much for uh, your attention and for listening to this talk. And now I'm opening the floor to the questions. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Alisa. Thank you, Alisa, for this talk. Thank you for uh, all the questions. Really exciting stuff. Uh, next Thursday, November 30th, we will have uh, Ben w Weinstein from uh, University of Florida. And he's going to talk about general models for airborne wildlife detection. Uh, we have a non-standard standard time for this seminar. So we always meet at three, but this time we'll meet at four. So November 30th at 4 p.m. Ben Weinstein, Weinstein. Welcome back. Thank you all for today. Thank you. Bye. Bye.